Well, I'm glad to be here, and it's a privilege and honor to uh, be at this church with brothers and sisters in Christ to preach the Word of our God, and uh, that's the Holy Bible, and uh, it's wonderful. And uh, I thank Brother Corbin to give me, uh, for giving me this opportunity to preach the Word of God so that all of us today are exhorted and edified in the Word of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Now, Jeremiah 10 is what was read by Brother Rich, and uh, based on that is the title of the sermon today. The title of my sermon is Hinduism, the Stock of Vanities. Hinduism, the Stock of Vanities. And what is, uh, uh, what is the meaning of this word vanity? And uh, this, the meaning of this word is worthless, trivial, hollow, or pointless. Also, anything, any system, or any being a person who is excessively prideful in his or her appearance. So this is the meaning of vanity. It encompasses everything that is worthless and futile and prideful. And Hinduism is such a system. And it is full of a lot of show. And I myself was a Hindu, but thanks to God that my heart was open to the gospel of Jesus and I got saved. And I have eternal life and I can never lose it because I believed that Jesus died for my sins and rose again from the, from the dead. And I'm confident that Almost everybody here is also truly saved by the Word of God. Now, I want us to focus on Jeremiah chapter 10, verse 3. So, Hinduism is full of many vanities, as a lot of false religions are. And one vanity that I would like to focus to, uh, to bring our focus to amongst other vanities, is this vanity of idolatry. And Jeremiah chapter 10, verse 3, the Bible reads, sorry, Jeremiah chapter uh, 10, verse 6. Jeremiah chapter 10, verse, just a few verses down. Verse 6, the Bible reads, For as much as there is none like unto thee, O Lord, thou art great, and thy name is great in might. Who would not fear thee, O King of nations? For to thee doth it appertain, for as much as among all the wise men of the, of the nations, and in all their kingdoms there is none like unto thee. But they are altogether brutish and foolish. The stock is a doctrine of vanities. So that's where the title of the sermon is, the stock. The, the Hinduism, which is the stock, and that's the stock of vanities. Now, the, word, the meaning of the word stock here is of a tree. If we go up uh, in, the, in the verses preceding, if we look at verse number 3, that's where the stock is defined. For what are the Hindus doing there? For the customs of the people are vain. For one cutteth a tree out of the forest, the work of the hands of workmen with the axe. They deck it with silver and with gold. They fasten it with nails and with hammers that it move not. They are upright as the palm tree, but speak not. They must needs be born, because they cannot go. Be not afraid of them, for they cannot do evil. Neither also is it in them to do good. So yes, an, an idol is stuck. It cannot move. But... Hindus, that's what they do to trees, amongst other things, of metal. That's what they do. Here, there's a prime example. There's a tree it has been cut down. What's left the stock? They will worship that. They'll carve it into an image and coat it with silver or gold and uh, worship and bow down to this. So that's what is a big vanity amongst Hindus, and I was one myself. But thank God I had doubts towards these idol worship, uh, these idol worships and the system of that pagan heathen religion. And that's why I'm, I thank God that I was drawn to the truth over time. Now, that's what an idol is. You see here, God is talked off. Here in verse uh, 6, the word for as much, it, it means seeing that. Seeing that it, as there is none like unto thee, o, o Lord, thou art great, and thy name is great in might. This is our God whom we know, for we are saved. But the Hindus don't know. They don't know that everything belongs to God. That's the meaning of the word appertain. So if we see the word appertain, that's in verse 7. Who would not fear thee, O king of nations? For to thee doth it appertain. Everything belongs to our God. But there are these heathens and pagans that do not fear God. And Hindus are once one of those because they're embroiled in worshipping idols, stones which are nothing. And as the Bible here defines that these are idols that are stuck, they are born. Born means to carry. I've seen that happen with my own eyes. There's this festival of this elephant god which they have, which they will carry on their shoulders in a southern state and take it to the Arab Arabian Sea to immerse it and let it dissolve. That's what they do. They have other ceremonies where thousands of thousands of people will get together and carry their idols in chariots. So that's the level of heathenism of these articles, these items which can be smashed with a hammer. That's what they bow down to and worship. 
Psalm 115, verse 8, you don't have to go there. The Bible reads, They that make them are like unto them, so is every one that trusteth in them. So Hindus trust in them. And those that make those idols, I don't know if all of them are Hindus, because India is full of other fake religions also. True Christianity is very little. A lot of it is Hindu. A, l a lot of, uh, of, of the minority religions, they're Catholics. They also worship idols. There's no difference between them and Hindus in a lot of, in a lot of ways. And who knows, Muslims, they also practice idolatry. They go around circles in Mecca and around that black cube which they kiss. Part of that. So idolatry is pervasive and it is beyond religions. And whosoever, the Bible in Psalm says, whosoever makes them, he is like unto them. So whosoever makes these idols is also static. Obviously they have legs and hands and uh, feet and mouth, they move. But this is a spiritual meaning that they're static. Spiritually they're static. They're frozen. They cannot do anything. And those that trust in these idols, they are exactly like that. It is, what should I say, it's hideous and hilarious to see what, what is done to idols. I myself have seen. You have, they have these statues, and uh, either with, a, with an elephant trunk or a snake hanging around their necks, and in their ceremonies, they will actually take food, which is an offering, and put it on the mouth of the idol as if the idol will eat it. In their brain, they think it will eat it, but I saw that same food stuck till next morning with a lot of flies and ants. This is the level of depravity of this idolatry amongst Hindus. Psalm 14, verse 2, you don't have to go there. Now, God, our God, He's so merciful. You see, Jesus, He died for everybody. Okay, the Father sent His Son, Lord Jesus Christ, who died for everybody. God is not willing that any should perish. But these, these people, some of them are so so darkened in their imaginations that they will not even open their eyes to the truth when it is shown to them. And our God, Psalm 14, 2 says, The Lord looked down from heaven upon the children of men to see if there were any that did understand and seek God. Yes, my hope, my prayer is, I hope that Hindus would seek the truth and not stay bowed down to these idols made of wood and stone coated with gold or iron. Doesn't matter. Because they're idols which have mouths that cannot eat, they have noses that cannot smell, they have eyes that don't see, they have feet that don't walk. The truth, what is the truth? The truth is of our God. Paul writes about this in 1 Corinthians 8, 4. We know that an idol is nothing in the world and that there is none other God but one. And thank God that He is our God and we are His children through faith. John chapter 4 verse 24 says, God is a spirit and they that worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. Yes, Jesus Christ, when He came to the earth, people saw Him. You know, they ate with Him, they touched Him. They saw Him, but hey, today, for us, God is a spirit. God the Father, there's no man that has, lived, uh, has seen God the Father and lived. And the Holy Ghost is of spirit. But our three in one, our Trinitarian God, today for us and all around us, is a spirit. When Jesus comes, people will see him. But we are, we are not at that point of time, and we're, we're not in uh, uh, you know, 1 AD or in uh, 30 AD. We are today, and God is a spirit. Maybe some people have a, a trouble, a difficulty, a challenge to imagine that there could be power in something that you cannot see. I don't know. Is, is, there, is there something that, that is lacking in them pertaining to faith? For what is faith that we have that saved us? For faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Through faith we understand that the worlds were framed through the word of God so that things which are seen are, were not made of things which do appear. So I hope, yes, this is my prayer, it is, that Hindus would open their eyes, would, would uh, flee from this idolatry, because Paul again writes, flee from idolatry. Psalm 119, verse 37, I hope that uh, Hindus would declare this someday soon, as the psalmist did, Turn away mine eyes from beholding vanity, and quicken thou me in thy way. Vanity, the idolatry, the, the vanity of idolatry. Worshipping these stones decked with gold, they're so, these temples are so rich, half the land is dying of hunger. But these temples, they're full of, I wouldn't be surprised if they're just full of billions of dollars. There's so much wealth there through the gold and the silver that is offered to these idols. But I hope that their eyes would be turned away from this vanity. They would stop beholding this vanity and would be quickened. Again, the meaning of the word quickened here is to, to be brought alive. You know, our spirits will be quickened because Jesus again, uh, himself again said in the book of John, uh, chapter, he said in uh, 
John chapter 6, he said this, it is the spirit that quickeneth, the flesh profiteth nothing. So we, we hope that Hindus would, would, would turn away from their idols and would, would look at things that are of spirit, for it is the spirit that quickeneth through faith. Another vanity, go with me to, again, we're in Jeremiah chapter 10, verse 11, please. Another vanity that uh, hin Hindus have is, that, is, is the vanity of worshipping many gods. There are numerous terms that are thrown around. Polytheism, henotheism, pantheism. To me, they all seem one. That which is not of Christ. It doesn't matter. Pantheistic, henotheistic, polytheistic. But Hindus are all, all of these, these theistics, these scientific words, these philosophical terms that the world has made, that's what they are. And Jeremiah chapter uh, 10, verse 11, the Bible reads, Thus shall he say to them, The gods that have not made the heavens and the earth, even they shall perish from the earth and from under these heavens. He hath made the earth by his power, he hath established the world by his wisdom, and hath stretched out the heavens by his discretion. So their gods... There are these gods that they have not made. They have not made the heavens. They have not made the earth. But they will make these entities to be gods. Anything that is, a, is in the figment of their imagination, they will make it into a god. We know again, our God, the Bible says, for there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. This is our one God, which is of spirit. But what do the Hindus do? If they like the sunlight, they will make the sun a god. They will make the moon a god. Every star is a god. If they like a tree, they'll make tr trees gods. They have this plant called Tulsi, and we have that flavored tea in our church building. I mean, it tastes good, but imagine the Hindus worship it. They, go, they circumambulate it. That's the same thing that we drink as tea. And animals, it doesn't stop there. Cows we know, we love the cow because we eat it. But they love the cow to worship it. The snake, the, 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 the symbol of, 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 the, of the serpent, of Satan, that's what they worship. So there's no limit to what will be deified with them. That is why this is just vanity. And, and they take pride in this worthless, trivial, hollow ideology of having multiple gods. Our God says, he says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God. The Lord our God is one God. Again in Isaiah 45, 5, the Bible reads, I am the Lord and there is none else. There is no God beside me. I girded thee, though thou hast not known me. God girded everybody. What is girding? Girding means to belt up. Yeah, we're, we're all uh, naked in our sin. But God has, has girded us up, especially those who have believed. But Jesus died for all. These others don't understand that in their faithlessness, in their polytheism, and their idolatries, they're naked. God is ready to gird them up, but no, they're just happy in their nakedness. And what grieves me more is that all these ideas of Eastern mysticism, these idolatrous aspects, these polytheistic, uh, heinous aspects are finding way into countries, continents that have a strong Christian legacy. It hurts, it hurts my heart to see America, North America, South America, Europe and Africa succumb to these uh, vain ideas. And these are furthered by people like Carl Sagan. He was an astronomer, an astrophysicist, and he made this uh, documentary series called Cosmos. And he's, uh, I believe, an utter atheist, and he was friends with Hindus who were telling him, yes, your physics and uh, chemistry that you're researching, this astronomy, it's telling you, yeah, you, you're watching the red shift with your giant telescopes that, that the universe is billions and billions of years old. The Hindus discovered this before you did with your telescopes. So Hinduism and their, their, their um, mystic, foolish mysteries find common ground with these scientists, and they are in cahoots, and that's what's furthering the permeation of the stupidity in America and Europe and elsewhere. The CERN, the largest Hadron Collider in the world, in Europe, they have Hindu gods outside their offices, outside their main building. That's what they're worshipping. The sun, the moon, the stars, the clouds, that's what they'll worship. Their, relig their religion itself is mist, like vapor. Even water vapor needs to collect together as form, as shape, to shape itself into a cloud before it starts raining. But their systems are without form, without, without shape, without solidity. And Michio Kaku with these, they all are the same. 
they will just further their aspects of lies and deceit leaning on Hinduism. And they forget because the foolishness of God is wiser than men and the weakness of God is stronger than men. And that no flesh, flesh should glory in his presence. But no, they are furthering, yes, make many gods, make elephants into gods, make lions into gods, make tigers into God. Everything will be made into a god. I myself was confused, thank God. As even I was very young, I used to ask my granddad, he was a, a wiser man, wiser man, but what wisdom is without Christ? So I used to ask him, why are there so many gods? He said, hey, don't worry. And uh, he kind of copped out of it. And he just said, you just pick one god out of all these, and that'll be good enough for you. Okay, well I did, but it was just always an insecurity, always this doubt, the same food that you stuck at the idol's mouth is there tomorrow and you think that the idol ate it. So these delusional aspects, thank God, were gnawing at me and thank God that I got saved. Now Jeremiah chapter 10, verse 11, the gods that have not made the heavens and the earth, even they shall perish from the earth and from under these heavens. And these are these many gods which the Hindus have made which we know shall perish. I hope the Hindus would wake up and see what the word of God, the true God says of what shall be of their gods that they will perish. Another vanity that human beings practice is the, is the vanity of worshipping human beings. This is the saddest thing. I mean, we don't bow down to human beings. We bow down to our God when we are in the closet praying to God in the spirit. We bow down, we kneel if we're able. But Hindus will bow down to fellow human beings. Again, these aspects are intricate. They're interlinked. Idolatry, polytheism, worshipping of human beings. They're all, they're all the same because Hinduism is just the same. A mix of nothingness. And I, you know, if you could just Google, you could find, you know, there's some children that are born with congenital malformations. You have Siamese twins, you have one body, two heads, two heads, one body, four arms, six legs. That's very sad. It, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very sad thing that a child will be born like that. But what Hindus will do before seeking medical surgical advice, they will just take that malformed child, that, that baby, to a temple. Oh, this is, if it's a, it's a, if it's a girl, this is the mother goddess reincarnated. If it's a boy, oh, this is that God that's reincarnated. Because we talked about Hindus having many gods. They've, they've got billions and billions of gods. Okay, if it's not billions and billions, it's millions and millions. It doesn't matter. It's not one. Doesn't matter. So they will just anoint that child with that. They'll, they'll uh, you know, uh, clothe him in red and, or crimson or saffron colored garments. Offer money and parade them through the streets. And people will come and bow down. Oh, this is that God. This is that God. So that's what happens. That's one aspect of worshipping human beings. Another aspect, they say it's, it's, uh, it's of civility. It's steeped in tradition. And I, I disagree with that tradition. Especially in North India, they would want us to bow down and touch the feet of our elders. The Bible talks about giving respect to our elders. You know, would rise up, sit from your seated position for a hoary head. The Bible says but here you will have to bow down and touch the feet. Thank God, some people were taking shortcuts. We didn't stoop down full, we just stopped at the knee. But their expectation was that we would go and touch the feet to worship human beings. And of human beings that are worshipped, the Hindu system is full of these fake gurus, these fake saints, these fake prophets, these fake swamis who just want self-worship self and self aggrandization And that's, that's what they've been doing in India, and they have been doing the same in the USA also. One saint, I don't know if you know of him, his name was Osho. He came in the, in the 70s and 80s, and he, he just fooled so many people. And there are others like uh, Mahesh Yogi. You know, even th these rock stars fall for them. I mean, there's, there's nothing to rock music. I, I pray they would, they would all get saved, but they would go after all these mystic things, not seeking the true God in the Bible. So these deceivers, these false prophets, these false saints, they all want to get worship for themselves, and that's what Hindus willingly do. They want to worship human beings. Go with me to Matthew chapter 4, verse 8, please. And these swamis, these, they're, you, you check the news, 
all kinds of crimes they commit, all kind of pedophilia they commit, all, all kind of uh, rapes they commit, drug addiction, etc. etc. So you name the crimes and that's what they do, yet people will not learn. They will still, even while they're incarcerated in jail, they will still pray for them. Such is the blindedness, the blindness that has that is, uh, shut the eyes of uh, Hindus. And this, this aspect of, uh, uh, you know, a seeking worship yourself, I think it's a satanic, it's, it's a satanic desire. And that's what's showed in Matthew chapter 4 verse 8. This is when Jesus had been baptized and he goes into the wilderness 40 days and 40 nights without food or drink. Matthew chapter 4 verse 8, again, the devil taketh him up into an exceeding high mountain and showeth him all the kingdom, kingdoms of the world and the glory of them. Verse 9, and saith unto him, all these things will I give thee if thou wilt fall down and worship me. Then saith Jesus unto him, get thee hence Satan, for it is written, thou shalt worship the Lord thy God and him only, thou shalt, oh, him only shalt thou serve. So what does Satan want here? He wants God himself to worship him. But obviously, Jesus is God and he tells him, get thee hence, Satan. But the Hindu swamis and gurus, they fall into the category of verse 8 and verse 9. If thou wilt fall down and worship me. That's what they want, that's what they do. And I hope that the eyes and hearts of Hindus would open to the gospel and would seize from these foolishnesses. For these, these fake saints are defined by Paul. You don't need to go there. Romans chapter 1 verse 22. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man and to birds and forfeited beasts and creeping things. Yeah, we can, give it, we can give the benefit of doubt to the general populace of India that they're gullible. But these saints over the last many millennia, they know the truth. The Imams, the Pope, all the Hindu high priests, the Swamis and the Gurus, they know this truth but they reject it. Now the gullible, thank you, the gullible people seeking leadership from these fakesters, they fall for them because who has changed the true God into these corruptible things? These, these people who profess themselves to be wise, they are the ones who are contorting the gullible people. Yeah, Psalm 139, we hate them, those hate God. I'm paraphrasing. We don't hate Hindus. We hate their swamis and their gurus because they know the truth of God and yet hate them and themselves are going into hell and they're taking others with them. So I love this how Paul defines these, these liars in the, book of, uh, in, the, in the book of Romans. And the Bible is, as believers, we have, we have our saints, the saints of truth, the saints of love, the, the saints of humility, you know, taught under Jesus Christ at his feet. For there was Peter, you know, Peter when he, meet, when he went to meet Cornelius in Acts chapter 10 verse 25, you don't need to go there. So God spoke with Cornelius, knowing that Cornelius is a just godly man, and his prayers were heard, and uh, the angel speaks to uh, Peter, and he, Peter goes with some of his friends to Cornelius. And Cornelius and Peter meet. And what happens here? And as Peter was coming in, Cornelius met him and fell down at his feet and worshipped him. I don't think Cornelius was Hindu, but you know, a lot of other uh, pagan systems have the same tradition of just falling down at the feet of men. Cornelius did the same. You know, he was worshipping a man there. But what did Peter do? But Peter took him up, saying, stand up, I myself also am a man. That's what a true saint is. The, tr the true saint of the true God. Yeah, if this were a Hindu saint, he would say, oh, continue, bring your family also. Let them all fall at my feet. Bring me your money also. Bring me food also. Bring me raiment also. That's what that would have done. But here, look what, what, look what Peter does. So such are the saints that we look forward to, not these liars and these deceivers. But again, coming back to Hindus, the gullible Hindus, I hope their eyes would open and they would see this truth, what the Bible says, so that they can also get saved. Now go with me to Acts chapter 17, verse 22. Another vanity is of superstitions, superstitions and divinations. In Acts chapter 17, verse 22, Paul is here in Athens. It's, it's, uh, it, it's a major city of, of, of Greece. 
and the Greek or Roman civilization is marked with heathenism and polytheism and idolatry. And here Paul is surrounded by all that. And look what Paul says. Then Paul stood in the midst of Mars Hill and said, Ye men of Athens, I perceive that in all things ye are too superstitious. He is defining Hindus here also. It's the same thing, too superstitious. The vanity of idolatry, the vanity of polytheism, worshipping many gods, the vanity of uh, worshipping men, and the vanity of superstitions. Now what is a superstition? It's defined as a belief or notion not based on reason or knowledge. Now we have reason and we have knowledge which we get through the Bible. We cannot be superstitious. And this belief or notion is in or is of the ominous significance of a particular thing, circumstance, occurrence, proceeding, or the like. So anything that Hindus will see, anything normal or abnormal, they will derive significance, significances of those events. The sun is too yellow, oh, this is a symbol of that. Oh, there are too many clouds today, oh, this could happen. I don't know if, it, if this happens in America or not, but yeah, if a black cat crosses your path, you will not go further. And so and so forth. I was just plagued by these, these foolishnesses. My, my mom used to say, hey, don't cut your nails after dark. I asked, why? She said, because my mom told me so. All right. Don't cut your hair on Tuesdays. Why? In fact, in North India especially, barber shops will not be open on Tuesdays. At least till the time I was there. I don't know if it's changed or not. So when I came to America, you know, it was always gnawing on my heart, why not, why not? So when I came to America, I used to get my haircut on Tuesdays. <laughs> and then I used to tell my mom, hey mom, I got my haircut on Tuesday. <laughs> and then she would frown and, you know. But thank God, today she's saved. I preached her the gospel, but those were days of uh, our heathenism. I myself was not saved those days. So these are these superstitions. And the Hindus are not understanding that not only is it impeding their entry into heaven, but as a nation, that land will not make progress because anything you do, oh, what could go wrong? You close the door of the car, it l sounds too loud, oh, sound of a demon or something. That's what they'll think. Highly superstitious, highly. And divination, what is divination? That's, that's a desire of people to foretell the future, incidents of the future, seeing uh, abnormal things happening in your current. And one example is that of uh, Nebuchadnezzar in the Bible, Ezekiel 21, 21. You don't need to go there. For the king of Babylon stood at the parting of the way at the head of the two ways to use divination. He made his arrows bright. He consulted with images. He looked in the liver. So various na nations and nationalities have their different types of divination. So here Nebuchadnezzar has this, uh, you know, his uh, peeve here that using his astrologers and saints, they would slaughter an animal and uh, lay the liver or any other organ on the ground and tease it. Tease means to irritate it or uh, cut it with a knife and see how the pieces fall, deciding where you will go to wage war. And Hindus are no different. They may not do these things to the liver, but they do the same thing with stars and they practice astrology. That is an inherent attribute of the fakeness of Hinduism. In fact, the whole nation is embroiled with astrology. Now, I believe that's one, important, one of the many other important reasons why that nation and those people will, will not progress. For what is astrology? The study that assumes and attempts to interpret the influence of the heavenly bodies on human affairs. What does the sun have to do, man, with you getting a job? It's giving you warmth. Enjoy it, enjoy it in, in, in the winter. In the summer, stay away from it. Oh, the moon is too yellow today. What does that have to do with your marriage, man? <laughs> or this planet, they have unnamed planets. And they, they, they would worship. They would worship. And what does the Bible say? Jeremiah chapter 10, verse 2. Thus saith the Lord, Learn not the way of the heathen, and be not dismayed at the signs of heaven. For the heathen are dismayed at them. That's what happens to the heathen, like the Hindus. H for heathen, H for Hindu. They are dismayed at these signs in heaven. And they have scrolls of, you know, astronomical, astrological charts, not, not astronomy. Astronomy has more science to it. But astrological charts of numbers and planetary alignments, which they'll consult with astrologers. Hey, you want to get married? See five astrologers. You want to apply for a job? Go and see this astrologer. Just do anything. You want to go abroad? You want to, you want to study? You want to invest your money somewhere? Seek the advice of an astrologer. You want to put a piece of bread in your mouth, see the astrologer. That's what they will do. 
And these birth charts. Yeah, a child is born. The physician comes later. The astrologer comes first to make their birth chart because that's what will span all their life as to how, what was their birth time, what was the place of birth, and what were the alignments of this and that planet. That's, well, that's what will decide. Not faith. Not in God. Gemstones, yeah. Emeralds, rubies, sapphires, each of these stones has their different uh, bearing on somebody's uh, life. And that's what in their, in, in their rings or their necklaces, they'll make sure that the stone touches them, touches their skin, because the stone cannot have its effect without contact. And auspicious days, just like for, for uh, haircutting, Tuesday, not on a Tuesday. Don't eat this on that day, don't do this on that day, very similar to the Jews. And the Judaizers and the Hebrew Roots movement for Sabbath on the Saturday, it does not exist. Not for us who are, who are saved, who are in the rest of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And what does Paul say in Romans 14.5? He says, One man esteemeth one day above another, another esteemeth every day alike. Let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. But again, we know. We know for we are saved. For we, are, we have the Holy Spirit inside our heart. Yes, my prayer is for Hindus to also turn to the gospel and get saved and, and, and know what God has for them. Another vanity is that of perversions. Go with me to 1 John chapter 3, verse 4. The vanity of idolatry, the vanity of many gods, the vanity of worshipping men, and the vanity of superstitions and, and divinations. And this is an important vanity, the vanity of perversions. And again, it, I thank God that I got saved out of the system of Hinduism because Hinduism is perverse in every way that you can imagine. Not just with yoga. They perverse the body. They contort it to such an extent it is anti-anatomical. What they do, the circuses they want to do and they do. They, they seek peace and meditation, right? That's what they say. To yoke up. That's the meaning of uh, yoga is to yoke up. And they want to yoke up with this unknown, unseen entity. That which is not of God is of, of the demon, and that's what they want to yoke up with. I went hunting in Pennsylvania, and uh, I, was, I, was, I was a believer then, and, and I was in this, you know, on this mountain, and I had my 30-odd six, a Remington, and this was 5 a.m., you know, the dark of the night turning into dawn, the birds starting to chirp a little, and, and it was so beautiful, so serene, it was so quiet, and I just thought of these yogis and these yogas. That's what they're seeking, this peace and quiescence. I would say to them, you get a hunting license and go hunting for deer, man. There you'll get the quiescence. There you'll get that quiet. There you thank the God for the beauty that He has made in the mountains and in the valleys and in the trees and the breeze, how it blows and, and the leaves, they rustle. So no yoga. Get a hunter's license. And there's going into s more serious perver perversions, a, a perversion of gender confusion. They have many gods. One important god they have is this fake god called Shiva, and he is half man and half woman by definition. The number of Hindus in this world today is 1.1 billion. Almost four times the number of people that are in the USA, and that's one of their important gods. Half man and half woman. So immediately the system, this fake system of the enemy of our God is furthering what? Transvestitism and all these other fakeries. For what did our God do? Jesus says in Matthew chapter 19, verse 4, And he answered and said unto them, Have you not read that he which made them at the beginning made them male and female? And Hinduism, this vanity, this, this vanity of perversion, is in its inception has eradicated this division altogether in this one important God. A lot of billion, millions, hundreds of millions worship this God. But that's what they're doing. God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, as in all churches of the saints. But their entities and their gods, they confuse. That's what they do. Hindu traditions, again, very sadly, they involve, you know, religious uh, festivals and 
important aspects or events in your life, they would, they would involve transvestites. They're also called hedras. I've seen it with my own eyes. You get married, you get transvestites to bless the new couple. Why? I saw that even as a, as a, as a child, as a young, young, very young boy. I, used, I was afraid I, oh, I would run away. And they would want to touch me to bless me. Oh, yeah, the bride and bridegroom's getting blessed. Get all others also to get blessings. And yes, they would want money also. So during weddings, they would be invited. They would be called. For what? For their blessings and to ward off evil spirits. Well, you have this true God. You don't need to be afraid of any evil spirit. But they would, they would have these hijras, these trans coming to your house. And if, if a new child, a newborn child is born, oh, get them again to get their blessings. Why? Because they can't have their own kids. That's why. Why can't they have their own kids? Because they're transvestites voluntarily. They decided to be that. But no, we'll call them to get extra blessings to the newly wed couple. And Hinduism has temples, which are, some of them are a thousand years old. I would, I would not ask you to look at that art because it is shameless and nude and perverse and filthy in every imaginable way. That's what they worship, their temples. What is our temple? It was what Solomon built. Before that was the tabernacle. And then... Uh, you know, the, 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 af after Solomon, the second temple was built at the time of Ezra and Nehemiah. There was no stupid art. There was no shamelessness there. And today, this is, our, this is the house of God. We are the church, brothers and sisters in Christ. But their temples, again, encompassing all aspects of idolatry and polytheism and foolishness, their temples are full of nudity. They even have sodomite postures there. That's their temple. This is the vanity of the perversion that Hinduism has. There's no definition. There's no clear definition of wrong or right at all. I had you go to 1 John chapter 3, verse 4. We know what is sin. For the Bible says, Whosoever committed sin transgresseth also the law, for sin is the transgression of the law. Our God has His laws. We know if we transgress them, that is sin. They have no God, they have no laws. Everything is allowed. There's no, there's no straight line. Hinduism, the internet calls Hinduism, it includes, it includes a diversity of ideas on spirituality and traditions, but has no unquestionable religious authorities. This is Wikipedia. See the words that they have chosen. Wikipedia is this liberal uh, you know, uh, website. It includes, Hinduism includes a diversity of ideas and spirituality and traditions, but has no unquestionable religious authorities. This means its religious authorities are questionable. This is the definition of Hinduism. They have no governing body, no prophets, nor any binding holy book. The Democrats are sleeping. The liberal, liberals are sleeping. This is liberalism. Hindus can choose to be polytheistic, pantheistic, panentheistic, pandeistic, henotheistic, monotheistic, monistic, agnostic, atheistic, or humanistic, or all and any other sticks that you can imagine. Everything is allowed. <laughs> Everything is allowed. This is what is Hinduism. These are the vanities that the system, which we hate, is full of. But as I said before, we don't hate. We don't, we don't hate people that don't hate our God. They're gullible people. And Jesus died for all. And we as believers, especially in America, the most powerful nation in the world, which is, which is, which is the hallmark of Christianity, of true Christianity, even though a lot of it is uh, not true. But yes, we are there and uh, you know, we have a lot of uh, a, a big burden on our shoulders, not for just our land and our people first, but other nations as well. Now, Hindus, uh, a majority of them live in India and Nepal. 
but there are various pockets of them in all big cities of all, all over the world. They are in the Caribbean islands, they're in Guyana, they're in Mauritius, it's an island in the uh, Indian Ocean, they're in this island called Fiji, it's in the Pacific Ocean. So there's, there, there's a good diaspora, a scattering of, of Hindus. And these are such that we should reach out to. You see, Hindus, they are in the natural state, like we were before we were saved. Right? Paul writes again, but the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. Now, we discern the words of God, we discern His doctrines. Why? Because we are no longer natural. We are spiritual in Christ with the Holy Ghost dwelling inside us. So we should go out and, by the power of God and the power, by the power of the, of the Bible and the power of the Holy Ghost, we should try our best to turn the natural state of Hindus to a spiritual state in Christ. So when they're no longer natural, they become spiritual, and then they can get saved and grow in the faith and the Word of God. We must turn Hindus from natural to spiritual. And it's our responsibility again. We have no excuse just because we're in Tucson, just because we're in, in Phoenix or anywhere else. For the Bible says, For unto whomsoever much is given, of him shall be much required. And to whom men have committed much, of him they will ask the more. So, a lot has been given to us in our, in our, in our, in our, in our legacy as real Christians. Um, I, 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 I hope there, there's some families here which are not first, first generation Christians. I hope there, there'll, be, there'll be people here or elsewhere which have many generations of true Christians amongst them. So that this, 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 is this, this is this responsibility that has been given to us, which we must further to share the gospel with heathens, especially Hindus. Yes, we know they're hard to get saved. They're hard to bring to faith. But with prayer and supplication for them, we must. We must preach the gospel. And um, the last verse is Matthew chapter 7, verse 24. Go with me there, please. You see, the Ninevites got saved in the book of Jonah. They were a highly heathen. They got saved. The Romans and the Greeks, by definition, heathen or more heathen than Hindus, cannot be compared. One is 99.99, one is the other is 99.98, or 99.99, the same. There's no comparison. They're equally heathen. But the Greeks and the Romans, they got saved. I hope that in these generations that have passed, the Hindus would also get saved. I hope in our lifetime, before Jesus comes. For Matthew chapter 7, verse 24, the Bible reads, Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them, I will liken him unto a wise man, which built his house upon a rock. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat upon that house, and it fell not, for it was founded upon a rock. This is us. We have the rock of our foundation, Jesus Christ. We have the rock of His Word. We are, we are in America. We are together as believers. And with the with, with preaching of the word, you know, we can get Hindus saved for what will be of them. Because they do not hear the word, or even if they do, they reject it. And what shall be of them? Verse 26, Matthew chapter 7, verse 26. And everyone that heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them not shall be likened unto a foolish man, which built his house upon the sand. Verse 27. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat upon that house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. There are two meanings that can be taken out of it. Yes, uh, uh, could be a state of unbelievers, could be a state of a believer who's not doing uh, much for God. But another meaning that I draw out of it is the system of Hinduism, which is not in Christ, is not allowing people to open their eyes and their hearts and their minds to Jesus Christ. I pray that this stock of vanities, this stock of vanities of Hinduism goes through this, which is on this bed of sand that is not on rock. And once we come in with full force, with the power and blessing of God, with the power of the gospel, we can make Hinduism like this house which is on a sand that the wind blows and beats upon it and it fell, and great was the fall of it. I hope with our efforts, the fall of Hinduism would be such great. The stock of vanities of Hinduism should fall, swept away, 
by our efforts in evangelism. So we'll end in prayer.